All right, good evening, everybody. I believe I can begin. Um, just to give everyone an introduction on um, um, who I am and what's my background. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Shobi. I am the head of um, Chilton House Julia Gable Centre at Cheetah Mall. Um, at the same time, I head the Julia Gable Center Enrichment Division. So the programs under our Enrichment Division would be um, Early Years, which is Play Club, Play Nest, Bilingual Play Club, Speech and Drama, and Readers and Writers. Um, but um, just to give you a bit more background about myself, um, I in school, I work um, with children as young as six months, right up to... Um, 18 years old. We have the teen camps as well. And um, outside school, I'm actually involved with the youth group. So I counsel uh, teenagers, uh, teenagers as young as 13, right up to 27, 28. And I work with parents outside school environment. So uh, how am I involved in that group is uh, I'm involved in a lot of counseling between teenagers, among teenagers, and between teenagers and parents. So that's my background. And the the topic for today is actually knowing your child's learning style. Now, if you're a parent of a preschool child, um, what I'm going to share today, uh, some parts of it would be relevant, but um, more of it is to prepare you as parents to face um, what your children will go through eventually in life, um, especially when they move on to primary and secondary, knowing your child's learning style is, is, is essential, I would say. Um, I'm, I'm a mother of two, so my eldest son is um, 11 and my daughter is 8, and um, they both have gone through uh, Chilton House and the whole Julia Gable Centre works. Uh, they've done Play Nest Play Club, um, Chilton House, and, and moved on to Speech and Drama. Um, so what I will be sharing is a lot of experiences that I personally have gone through as a parent, as well as um, some of the cases or some of the situations that I faced outside school. All right. Um, so let me start by first telling you what, um, or giving you a definition of what learning style is. We will begin sharing the slides. Okay, so um, when we talk about learning styles, the three common learning styles, uh, it would be visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and fourthly, I've put here, putting it all together. Um, because you will see as children grow, uh, their learning styles change. And even us as adults, our learning style could be a mixture, visual and auditory put together, kinesthetic and auditory put together. So sometimes it's putting all of it together. Now I'm going to start off uh, my session with some questions that I have personally encountered people asking. So I'm going to read out some questions to you and then eventually answer these questions later on at the end of the session. So uh, one question example question uh, or common question that I usually get would be, my son insists on jumping from topic to topic. What can I do? It's a common thing for children to jump from topic to topic if you're speaking to them. Um, later on, um, I, I personally face it even till today with my young ones. Um, they're in primary, but uh, I, I can see it already. Um, so that's 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 one question. Number two, uh, my daughter only wants to do chores if I am there to help her, even though I know she can do them by herself. How can I get her to work by herself? So that's another question. Number three, sometimes when I'm working with my child, he seems to miss the whole point entirely. Is there something wrong? Another question. My child comes from school too tired and hungry to start her homework. Number five, my daughter says that she can concentrate better with the TV on. How can that be the best way to do homework? A common question, a common situation that parents face today. Um, and, and lastly, one more question. I've heard that there are various intelligences. Are they related to learning styles? Um, so I'll address this later on as well. Uh, today's topic is purely on learning styles, but I will touch a bit on multiple intelligence towards the end. All right, so let's begin. Learning styles. When working with children, whether helping them to master a new skill, or wanting them to remember to perform a task, it is very important to understand their preferred learning style. Um, by gaining an appreciation of how our children take in 
and recall information, we can, as parents, improve our communication with our children, decrease frustration, and be more effective in our interactions. Now, the key thing here, which is highlighted in red, is taking in and recalling information. That is where learning styles come in. All right, so now to start off, let's do a bit of exercise for, 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 for you back home and, and for all those who are listening. Let's see what's your preferred style. All right, so I'm going to give you some situations. Uh, so that this, will, this will help us better understand um, your learning style, our learning style. Okay, situation number one, when you're receiving driving instructions, uh, driving directions, do you prefer, number one, to have a written list of all the turns or for someone to tell you the route or to have a map and trace the turns with your finger. Now, you may be thinking the third one um, is not something that um, you would do, but um, some kinesthetic children, they prefer doing it that way. All right. Of course, they don't need directions. I'm just giving situations that are relatable to adults as adults. Situation number two. What about if you need to pick up a few items at the food store? Do you, number one, make yourself a list? Number two, talk out aloud to yourself? Or number three, do you picture yourself opening the fridge and cabinets to find what items you need? All right, scenarios. Let's look at a different, um, so, so here, now what I'm going to do is sort of give you an idea of what learning style you have. Now, if your answers um, was, if your answers were that you needed directions and you needed to list it down, to write it down, then you're more of a visual learner. You need it to be written. You need to see it. So you're using your eyes to see it, and that's how you register better. You're definitely a visual learner. Or if you're someone that prefers the information to be spoken to you, then you tend to be an auditory learner. You need more of the listening um, bit. But number three, if you need a motion or movement to help you, um, what we're talking about is taking in information and recalling information, then you show a kinesthetic learning preference. So I hope I've got that laid out, the difference between um, visual learning, visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners. All right. Now, I'm going to give another situation. Now, let's go to our children. Another situation. This is a situation. It's a real-life interaction between a mother and a son as the son was trying to learn where to put commas. Okay? So, the mother says, let me see what you have written so far. Okay, let me show you where to put the commas. And son hums to himself. Mm. And mother, in a louder voice, says, let me show you where to put the commas. Come here and look at the paper. Son says, can't you just tell me? Mother says, it's writing. I can't just tell you. Come and look at this paper. Son, covering his eyes, says, I don't want to look. Just tell me. Now, this is probably not a situation you're facing with preschoolers, but you may face this situation when they're older in primary school or even secondary. All right. Now, part of the problem is that the mother here and her son are using different styles of learning. It is almost as if they are speaking two different languages. In this case, the mother is approaching the teaching from a visual stance. While the child is expressing a strong preference, you should uh, probably gauge this by now, from an auditory, uh, he's, he's, he's voicing it from an auditory angle. We often expect, which is normal from others, we expect them, especially our children, to learn the same way that we do. And, and, and I believe as a parent gone through uh, this phase many times, that's where the problem lies. We are used to a certain learning style and we often expect our children um, to learn the same way. All right. Now, it can be su su surprising to discover that others take in information in a different way. Without this knowledge, it can be frustrating for us and for our children when we try to work with them. Although everyone has a preferred learning style, if the information is more challenging or if we need a change of pace or if our primary method isn't working for whatever reason, we can try an alternative approach. That's why it's important to know all three learning styles and understanding the need um, why we may need to combine certain learning styles so that we can always um, alternate which approach we use. We don't need to keep doing more of what isn't working. And I believe you agree with me on that. It is important that we can identify our children's preferred method, 
but it's also important that we are well versed in all three styles so that if one approach does not work we can switch to another all right um, so now let's go in detail into visual learning now, before I go uh, into visual learning, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, you would see it on your um, screen. Just click on it and type in a question that you may have. And our team over here, they'll, they'll help me. Um, they'll pass the questions to me and I'll answer it at the end of the session. Okay, now let's go into visual learning. Now, about 65% of people are visual learners. That's a fact. And they prefer to gather information by looking at pictures or written instructions. These are the people who prefer to read directions or watch a demonstration to learn how to do an activity. Visual learners can see ideas remembering details as pictures in their mind. As adults, visual learners tend to make lists organize our, you know, we intend to organize our thoughts by writing them down. Uh, we take notes to help us focus during a conversation. All right. Um, as I'm saying this, picture yourself as well, um, so that as we're going through this, try to think of your children as well. When you tell them something, are they the sort that feel they need to make down a list, um, organize their thoughts, um, put it down into picture form? Um, let, let me give you an example of a struggle I'm facing right now. Okay, so usually when I go, uh, when we go on a holiday, right, I will tell my children, pack your things. All right. So can you get um, your toothbrushes ready, your toiletries, uh, we need three sets of t-shirts with, with your shorts, um, get your swimming suit. And I tend to say it verbally. All right. And then when I come back after work, you know, assuming that everything would be in order already, I would see that they would have missed out something. Obviously, um, what came to my mind when I faced this situation initially was, um, hey, I just said it verbally. Maybe my children prefer uh, if I write it down. Okay, so that is when I started writing down checklists for them and they used to tick it off. I know it's tedious, but uh, this is a simple chore, simple instruction that I was giving my children. And I realized just by telling them, because I have it in my mind, I'm picturing it in my mind. I know how many they need uh, for them. They couldn't register it. So I had to make a list and leave it on our, our on our table and and they had to you know look at the list and then pack look at the list and then pack and, and and do a quick checklist for me that worked for them i mean that helped me um to not get so annoyed when i come back after a hard day of work and to see that things were not done simple thing even at home um when i leave before i leave for work i usually write down the chores that i want them to do at home so that when i get back home it's all done because it's all in a list right so i'm just giving an example how um passing on an instruction not only depends on our um visual our our learning style but also the receiver's learning style in this case our children okay now some clues that a person is a visual learner is that they tend to use phrases such as i see what you mean now as i'm saying this um also picture colleagues you work with because it, it's the same uh it's the same for not just our children i know today's topic is for parent and and and, and children it's a parenting angle but also it involves one spouse to another spouse, um, one key member and their team members, your colleagues. So just picture situations in your mind. All right. So some clues that a person is a visual learner, they would say things like, I see what you mean. Uh, imagine this, picture this. I I'm very much a visual learner. So when I speak to colleagues here or my teammates, yeah, I'll say, imagine these guys, uh, picture this. Because in my mind, I would have pictured it already. All right. So I um, People who are visual learners, they tend to use phrases like that. Now, children who are visual learners may like to have pictures up to remind them of what they need to do to get ready for bed or in school. For example, in Chilton House, they have pack cards where the teachers um, show them what happens throughout the day. The timetable is put into pictures and it's put on their whiteboard so they know, okay, after speech and drama, we're going to have Mandarin. After Mandarin, we're going to the toilet. Um, it's 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 already pasted on their whiteboard and the teachers change it depending on what the timetable is like now in Chilton house at a, um, because we're dealing with preschool children now for preschool children um, they could be they could have a combo the, the way they learn something 
they could be kinesthetic at some time. Uh, they could be kinesthetic sometimes. They could be visual learners. They could be audio learners. So what preschools do, especially Chilton House, is they incorporate all three learning styles in introducing a concept and reinforcing that concept in class. So uh, let me give you an example. If they were learning the letter C in school, they would introduce um, visually how letter C looks. Um, they would get them to write it down because for the kindergartens especially, they learn how to write it already. Um, they get, they see a puppet, a cuddly caterpillar puppet for the N1s and the N2s, nursery 1s and nursery 2s, 3 and 4. And the puppet would have the letter C on um, its body. So that is getting them to visualize it as well, to capture the image of the letter C being on the caterpillar. At the same time, um, they would sing a song because kinesthetic learners, they like songs and they like to move around. So let's make the letter C. So they form the whole letter C with their body. They use Play-Doh to form the letter C. It's just not using a pencil so that they are um, doing things hands-on to learn a certain concept. So there are songs, there is puppet, there are puppets, it's written, being written on the board, pictures are being shown, um, they write it for themselves on paper. Different approaches, different learning style approaches are being used in Chilton House, I can say for Chilton House, um, to teach a concept and to reinforce a concept. Because for preschoolers, you must understand, um, they learn in various forms. Um, therefore, it, it, it's that's why the school uses all approaches to teach a certain concept and to reinforce a certain concept. Okay, now let's go back to your children. If you have older children um, or children when they come home. Now, when you're trying to work with them, you may notice children staring into space. Now, to the untrained eye, it may seem as though they are daydreaming. But what they are actually doing is trying to picture the answer in their mind. If you were to ask them, they're picturing the answer in their mind. Or if you're telling them something, they're picturing it in their mind. These are visual learners. Visual learners, uh, we also need to know, visual learners, are, are, they tend to be distracted by clutter of movement because they're very focused people. Uh, for children who are visual learners, they may not like to look at pictures of what they need to do and keep their... Um, they may like, sorry, they may like to look at pictures of what they need to do and keep lists of their ideas. So what I'm saying now applies to your older children who are in primary, secondary, and even your teenagers, yeah? This is a brief introduction of what visual learners are. Let's move on to auditory learners. Now, auditory learners comprise approximately 30% of the population. They tend to learn best by hearing verbal instructions, either spoken directly to them or by repeating the words under their breath to themselves. So have you seen children or, or, or colleagues that you know or your spouses or relatives, when you say something, they would, have, they would repeat it again to themselves? These are auditory learners. This group needs to hear the information in order to learn and commit the, the ideas to memory. As adults, this group may, may talk aloud to themselves. They may repeat ideas to be sure that they've heard it correctly. Some clues that a person is an auditory learner is the use of phrases such as, what I hear you saying is, or let me tell you how I did this. Listen to this. Now, let me ask you this. Have you had colleagues or do you have colleagues or do you have uh, people that you know that tend to recap whatever you say? These are the people that are auditory learners. Uh, they tend to recap so that they hear it for themselves, they digest it one more time, okay? Now, but when it comes to working with auditory children, you may want to tell them what you want them to do. These children may need to sound a word to hear how it is spelled. For example, they need to sound it um, to hear how it's spelled. Even when reading to themselves, if you notice, this group will need to repeat either silently or just underneath their breath, important facts or directions for adults, yeah? Also know that they may become easily distracted by background noises. As a result, these children may request to have background music to block out unexpected noises. They may want to talk with you about what they are learning to help solidify the ideas. This is where my son comes into the picture. Um, I Personally, I feel I'm a visual learner as well as an auditory learner, but I'm strongly uh, a visual learner. I cannot work with background music. And if you notice teenagers these days or, or, or our Gen Zs and the I generation these days, they tend to have music 
at, at their background. You know, they need music in the background. Um, my son works better. He's 11. But I only realized this later and understood it myself because I myself cannot work with music um, as my background. When I'm doing any work, I cannot have any music. I'm a musician, by the way, so which is... Um, quite ironic that I cannot have music as my background while I'm focusing on doing something. I need complete silence. Um, but for my son, with complete silence till today, he cannot concentrate on his math homework or his science homework or, or, or writing an essay. But if he's got music on, he tends to work better. It's ironic, but um, I see it for myself as a parent. Um, he can really concentrate. So because it, it bothers me, and I sit at the same table, so it bothers me. So what I do is I give him a, a, a headset and he puts it on and he listens to music while he's doing his math homework or while he's drawing out his science chart. And and I keep an eye to see, you know, that he's not getting distracted. He does not get distracted, but music helps him concentrate better. Right? Now let's move on to kinesthetic learners. This third style comprises most young children and I would say mostly preschoolers all right who learn by doing and touching and account for approximately five percent of all adults what do we mean by doing and touching they get all hands-on and as I mentioned earlier Chilton House um, uses all three approaches in introducing a concept or reinforcing a concept and um, if you actually had the chance to see what our teachers do from time to time, they get their children to stand up, um, use their hands to move about, to exercise, and then um, get them to do something. And then they'll do a physical activity and then they'll get them to focus and then do a physical activity. It's just that children who are kinesthetic learners, they have a shorter attention span, so they cannot sit and focus on something for too long. And that is why teachers use um, kinesthetic approach to get their lesson across, meaning um, instead of just learning how to write the letter C, I'm just going back to that example, learning how to follow the dotted lines and writing the letter C, they get them to use Play-Doh to form the letter C because their ideal goal is to get the children to know how to form the letter C. So they use Play-Doh to get them to form the letter C or kinetic sand and to get their finger to write or to draw the letter C in, in the kinetic sand. So, um, I hope you get an understanding of what kinesthetic learners need and, and how for, for preschool especially, how we incorporate uh, this approach into our teaching. Now, kinesthetic learners prefer to move to learn, right? That's the gist. This would be the adult, for adults especially, yeah? This would be the adults who constantly, do you know, see them playing with their pencil. Um, they're the ones that constantly need to be doing something physically in order to concentrate. It's not that they're not concentrating, but keeping um, them, you know, by moving, constantly moving or doing something, they are, they, they are able to focus better. When faced with a new project, this group, kinesthetic learners, would prefer to learn by jumping in and doing rather than reading or asking for directions. All right. Now, a clue that a person is a kinesthetic learner would be the use of phrases such as, I get it, let me show you. They're very action-based people, hands-on people. All right. Children who are kinesthetic learners may need to move their whole body to learn, which is the example that I gave you earlier of what we do in Chilton House. They're often fidgety. So, uh, so a word for parents here. Um, when you see your children being fidgety, um, do not um, immediately conclude that something's wrong with your child because I have met parents who feel that they feel, you know, the moment their children are fidgety when they're learning or when they're sitting down and they're trying to tell them something that, hey, something's wrong with my child. Um, we've seen it in Chilton House. I've personally seen it outside as well. They're children, they're preschoolers, um, and they need to be moving. I mean, children these days, and even more, I must say, even more these days, we see children who constantly need to move in order to focus, in order to learn. Now, um, you may feel as a parent that your child isn't listening to you because he's swinging his legs or getting in and out of his chair or falling onto the floor. But this is the way 
they cope with focusing. This is the way they focus. This is the way they learn. In general, kinesthetic children cannot concentrate. As I mentioned earlier, their attention span is short for more than 10 minutes without getting up and moving. They might practice their spelling words while bouncing a ball or running in a place or walking up and down the stairs. Have you seen children, your older children, when they need to memorize something or when they need to learn something, they're walking up and down. That helps them focus. That helps them remember. That helps them pay attention. Okay? This movement actually helps the mind focus. All right? Those who fall in this category can, can be easily distracted by the movement of other people or things in their environment. They learn best by doing such as writing or drawing or acting out whatever they're learning, okay? Now, what does it mean um, about putting, what does it mean when I say putting it all together, uh, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic? Now, let's go back to the first instant that I, that I showed you about the mother that was trying to get the child to learn how to put commas, all right? Let me read it out again to you. So, mom says, let me see what you've written so far. Okay, let me show you where to put the commas. Child hums to himself. Mm. Mother says, do you want me to show you? Son says, can't you just tell me? Mother says, you would rather have me tell you? Now, this is a mom who's understood already. Okay, and son says, yes. Now, for the mother, it's difficult. So, mom says, hmm, I'll try. It's easier for me to write it down because... Um, that's her best learning style. So let me write down my thoughts and I'll tell you what I am doing. We'll see if that makes sense. And son says, thanks, mom. All right. I'm just summarizing what actually happened between that mom and son. Um, so it's very important. What I'm trying to say here, it's very important for a parent to understand your child's learning style. It makes things easier at home. It, it will make it easier for you when your child grows and moves into primary, secondary, and later on. Um, because trust me, it reduces your frustration as a parent when you seem, when it, when it seems that you can't get through to your children. Okay, so here are some tips, right? Some tips for you, um, um, like um, to, to give you an idea of what can you do for children who are visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners, okay? So now for visual learners, write information down on paper. Some children register better with a list. Some register better with pictures. Um, so a second option is to draw pictures or use pictures from magazines. Um, if you print it out, put it, if, if you're really finding it difficult to get through to your child and you know your child is a visual learner, um, Print out pictures because pictures stays better in their memory for visual learners. Use bright colors because colors play a very important part uh, for visual learners. Use different colors for different ideas sections. Um, allow your child to doodle or take notes because that's them um, taking that information from you and registering it and putting it in their own way so that they remember better. Um, for us adults, you remember some of us um, when we were growing up or studying, we like to highlight. I, I, I don't know about you, but I used to take a few highlighters and highlight um, different areas with different colored highlighter. It's so that, um, you know, when you're doing your exam, it, when, you, when, you, when you come to that question, you have a photographic memory of how your page, your textbook look like, or how your activity book like, or how your notes look like. Um, I, I hope you get what, what I'm saying. These are visual learners. That, that's why I say mostly the older ones like me, um, we are visual learners. That, that's how we grew up and we capture things in our memory. We need to write it down when we learn something, when somebody says something, we write it down. It registers better that way. So your child could be a visual learner. And if you know that your child is a visual learner, Practice this at home. In whatever you're doing, write it down. If that doesn't work, draw pictures. Um, for the older ones, get them to write it down. And if you're writing something down, use bright colors or use colors, all right? Now for auditory, auditory learners, what can we do? Um, read directions or instructions out aloud to them. Um, auditory learners are easy to work with because all you have to do is speak to them accurately correctly 
um, and and they register just by listening to you. Uh, auditory learners are very good with languages. Uh, if you if if we go into multiple intelligences, these are the people that are very good with languages. All right. Um, so say it out aloud, but you have to be clear. We all have to be clear as parents. Um, how clear our instruction is. Um, you see, for for visual um, learners like myself, um, we tend to write better because we're clearer when we put a chart down or make a list. But when we say it out, um, we tend to be fast in our instructions. We tend to be fast in what we say. Because in our mind, we are picturing it differently. But when we word it out, we are wording out what's in our mind. We may not be as thorough as what we are we have in our mind. So for auditory learners, if your child is an auditory learner, you must remember that they are purely depending on what you say. So however you put that instruction across, whatever you tell them, we need to be accurate, we need to be detailed, we need to be clear. All right? Um, for the younger ones, sing a song. Teaching them multiplications, sing a song. Um, that works. That really works for auditory learners. Um, that's why ABC is also in a song form. Um, a lot of songs. If you, if you notice, there are a lot of songs that are in a tune form so that it registers better with children. Um, auditory learners, uh, um, sorry, to go back, uh, I've told you that preschoolers and toddlers, they have, they are, um, they have, they are actually, they, they are a, mi a mixed group. Sometimes visuals work for them, sometimes auditory works for them, sometimes kinesthetic works for them. So uh, in play club, um, whenever we want our children to put the toys away, all we do is sing a song. Let's put the toys away. Let's put the toys away. Time to put the toys away. That Let's put the toys away. Um, within a few classes, the moment our teacher, or I, I just start, let's, you'll see the toddlers. Toddlers. I'm talking about toddlers here who are two years old picking up their toys and putting it into baskets already. Music registers best with them. That's why we start off. One of the earliest things we get our babies and toddlers to be exposed to are songs. They register very well with songs, tune, beats, rhythm. Um, so use songs for the younger ones. It, it really helps. Um, it's just that as parents, if, uh, if you have the patience to turn everything into a song, into a tune, do try it. You will see the difference. Um, we've seen parents who go home after our play club class and all they have to do in order to get their children to put their toys away is to sing the same song. Let's put the toys away and they see for themselves how children put their toys away. A lot of transitions in school, a lot of instructions in, in school, in Chilton House as well, is sung to them. Let's wash our hands, uh, clean up time, clean up time, um, stand in a straight line. Um, it not necessarily has to be in a tune, sometimes a rhythmic form or in a rhythm form, uh, in a rhyme form registers with children because there is a constant beat to it. That is how they register. Okay, so that's auditory learners. What about kinesthetic learners? Create a motion to remember information. For example, counting on fingers or forming the letters with their hands as they try to memorize how to spell a word. Um, number two, allow your child to bounce a ball or march in place. Uh, number three, take free, frequent breaks. These are the children that have shorter attention spans, so constantly give them breaks. Uh, don't get them to sit down and work on something for half an hour. That, that would be a miracle if they do so, but give them constant breaks. But, but this is purely based on we as parents knowing what our children's learning style is. Um, for example, uh, just, to, just to give you an example, creating a motion for them to remember information. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a visual learner, but till today, till today, when I get my daughter to memorize her multiplication, um, I don't see it in my head. Rather, I use my fingers. This morning, she was doing timetables four. And as she was saying, one times four is four, two times four is eight, because she, she's trying to memorize it. Um, in my head, I was doing 4, 8, 12, 16, 24, 20, 24, 28. I use my fingers. For my calculations, I very much use my fingers um, because that is how I picked up maths. I picked up through my actions and my fingers. It's not so much in my mind. I don't picture the timetable in my mind. Um, I'm using my hands. So when it comes to math, somehow I'm a kinesthetic learner. I need to use actions. All right. That's just to give you an example. Um, now, let's talk about providing reminders. If you're a parent, just like me, 
it's a hassle <laughs> when children don't remember instructions that you give and we constantly need to remind them right that's when we as parents can get frustrated so um, when it comes to reminders just a quick tip for visual learners use a note or a picture or for the older children use a chore list i've tried it it works with my children um use a chore list put it on the fridge put it on your table on their study table whatsoever please get this done number one number two number three and get them to check it off right it helps them number two uh, auditory learners use a word or a phrase um, have them make up a recording of what chores they need to complete these are the learners where you need to tell them if you tell them all right when you come back from school take off your shoes put your socks for washing um, sorry i'm using my classic home example put your socks for washing have your bath um, have your lunch take a short nap and start on your homework right for auditory learners you need to get them to repeat that come back home take off your shoes put your socks for washing have your bath um see i can't even remember what i said earlier have your bath get your lunch have a nap and do your homework all right if i were to show kinesthetic learners who are also auditory learners let's say they are a combo i would get them to repeat as well as use their fingers believe it or not kinesthetic learners and auditory learners those who are combo sometimes they come together they register better when they use their hands as well so for these children you can even ask them what was step number three they will remember because for them they have they have um, listened they remember from the instruction you've given them and they've placed it into an action into a number okay if the child was visual auditory and kinesthetic they would have in their mind as you're saying it visual them taking out their shoes they visual they would visualize their shoes they would visualize their laundry basket because that's where you need to put their socks they need to put their socks they would visualize their whatever they visualize for their bath their towel um, they need to take their nap they'll probably visualize their bed they would register better by visualizing what you've said and if they are a combo point out the fingers because they'll remember better as well you need them to repeat it because they're also auditory learners get them to repeat after you just to see if they've got it and they tend to learn and register better when they repeat after you okay now um sorry i've missed one point which is kinesthetic learners for kinesthetic learners when it comes to providing reminders use a motion or a gesture um don't forget to brush your teeth um don't forget to put your shoes in the basket um they tend to remember it that we use a motion or a gesture okay an important pointer for all you parents if you are already in a frustrated situation remember when one approach isn't working try another doesn't work try another doesn't work try another although there are just three learning styles but the approach could be different for example for visual learners some prefer notes some prefer picture cards uh, auditory learners some probably need to repeat um, or you need to put it into a song um, it, there are different approaches although their learning style may be some but the approaches could be different so don't give up seriously as parents uh, my advice to you is don't give up uh, parenting is a journey it's a patient journey um, don't give up um, it's just that there, there's, a, there's this beauty when you know your child's learning style and when you're aware of it and when you know it and when you do try different approaches things become a lot easier yeah um that much i can guarantee you because i'm a lot calmer now as a parent as as not what i used to be before i used to get frustrated with my eldest son especially not knowing he's very much an auditory listener auditory learner and i'm very much a visual learner so we always had that clash right so it's very important to know your child's learning style all right now besides learning styles are there other factors this is not working that's not working this is not working that's not working okay i don't know what my child's learning style is yes there are other considerations not everything goes back to learning style all right now some of the other considerations one important piece to consider when working with your child is um, their stage of development whether they are in a period of relative calm or internal turmoil imagine this your child is frustrated and here you are singing a song um, 
to say, hey, I need you to put the toys away, toys away, toys away. But your child is frustrated because he's hungry. It's not going to work. All right. That's what I mean by are they calm or are they facing internal turmoil? You need to know their current mood, their current situation, their stage of development. OK, um, because um, tr- learning style or putting something across is not a formula. It's an idea. It's an approach, but it's not a formula that it will work the same at all times. Just like how you sing an instruction to your child at the age of two. If you sing it to them at the age of six, they will look at you and laugh. Uh, they may be auditory learners, but the song may not be working anymore, right? Or they're prob- probably their learning style has changed. Okay, so things to consider, stage of development. Number two, their temperament. Um, how easygoing are they? How slow to warm or challenging their innate traits are? That's something we need to consider as well. As parents, um, when, you, when your children get older, if you do have older children, you know their temperament tends to change. Uh, they could be one way today, another way the next minute, um, in a completely different temperament the next day. Things change, moods change. Uh, take that into consideration, all right? So don't blame yourself. It's not your approach, but it's just how they're doing for the day, okay? Their maturity level. How ready and able are they to do a particular task? Um, you could be asking them to do a certain chore, which they're not ready for. They're just not able to do. It's got nothing to do with their learning style, but it's probably that they're not ready for that task. So things to consider. Number four, other outside factors that may be influencing your children, such as the birth of a sibling. Um, we've seen it in school. I've seen it in among, among children as young as two. The moment the mom's pregnant, the older sibling's temperament changes. They don't respond to anything. Um, you may be doing things right, but they're just not responding. It's just not registering because there is an outside factor. Mummy is pregnant. Believe it or not, children, the older sibling, they sort of get this vibe. They know that you're pregnant. Uh, that's what happened to me that my older one knew that I was pregnant um, even before I took the pregnancy test. They have this innate thing. It's not proven um, scientifically. I'm just saying that um, I've experienced it. I've heard of other parents saying it and, and I've personally experienced it, they do know. You you would see a sudden change in their mood, a sudden uh, change in their tantrum. I mean, I mean, they become, they start having tantrums or they're probably a lot more responsible, right? Um, so one of another outside factor is them have, uh, you having, them having another sibling. A move, moving from one home to another home, moving them from one school to another school. Um, divorce, remarriage um, and the start of the school year all right there are other outside factors that that um, could be contributing factors to why a certain you you can't get to why you can't get through to your children it's just not their learning style now one encouragement note over time um, our preferred style does not remain constant Throughout life, we ourselves are often required to use different styles at different ages. Um, if you were to recall, and if if you can recall how you used to learn or how you used to be receptive when you when you were in primary or when you were in college or university or, or now, how are you receptive or how do you re- receive things as an adult could be different because over the years, one's learning style changes as well. It evolves, it changes, it, it, it you may need and a different you probably add a different learning style together so it changes over time okay so young children tend to learn best by doing so that's a tip if you have preschoolers at home they definitely learn best when you get them to do something uh, and that's why in school as well in Chilton house teachers get children involved in learning it's always a teamwork it's a group work let's do this together let's get our hands in this together um, imagine trying to teach a youngster how to tie his shoes by reading him a story or by showing him a picture it may be possible but it'll be easier to actually show demonstrate and attempt the sh- steps all right so younger children get them involved because when they do it it registers better in their mind they remember better okay um, A college student, for example, just to show you from from a toddler, from a preschooler, from a young child, and when he moves on to college, a college student tends to be adept at learning through reading his textbooks and listening to his professor's lectures. He needs to be a visual learner 
as well as an auditory learner. I mean, uh, for those of you who've gone through um, higher education, you know that as your lecturer teaches you, you have to take down notes, you have to be able to listen and to write and retain that information. If, if your lecturer, if you did not capture whatever he said, um, you may not have the notes um, to, to study, right? Of course, now we have mobile phones to record what our teacher, teacher is saying. But back then, we had to use two different learning styles in order to accomplish something, visual and audit auditory. Now, I'm going to go to the questions that I actually gave earlier, the start of my session, all right? So just to see what's, how can we answer these questions? What 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 um, can be done for these situations? Number one, if you, if you remember, I, I don't think I had it on my slide, so I'm just going to read out the questions again. Help. When I work with my child, he insists on jumping from topic to topic. He won't finish one section before he goes on to the next. It drives me crazy when I'm working with him. What can I do? Um, here, it sounds like difference in approach. People who prefer to finish one task before starting the next work in a sequential order. All right. For those who prefer to approach their work in a sequential manner, it can be difficult to work with a child who prefers to jump around doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. All right. Um, as adults, we like sequence. Children tend to jump around. OK, for some children, it can be boring to finish part A before going into part B. This method is called random. They skip around to keep themselves interested and on track, despite how disjointed it may feel to those like us who are sequential. All right, now you can try an experiment. Allow your child to do this his way for one week and see how it goes. Um, if he completes his task satisfactorily, then let him do it this way. If it looks disorganized, um, this random approach can and does work for some. Um, even if it, sorry, even if it looks disorganized to the sequential learner, this random approach can and work for some. The key thing to parenting, um, although I'm going off topic a bit, the key thing to parenting is to, one way to have successful parenting, is to work with your child, no matter what the approach is. Always give them the option to try it their way. If it doesn't work, let's try it this way or come to a compromise, right? So if your child tends to jump here and there, Let's try it his way because that's that's how he concentrates. That's how he focuses. Let's try it for some time. If it doesn't, why don't we try to do it this way? Okay. Um, now let let me go to the second. Um, sorry, one more thing. Adults, just just a tip for adults who tend to work in a random manner. Uh, statistics show that they are more adept at juggling many tasks and at staying on track despite interruptions. So if your child is someone who likes to jump from one task to another task, bear that in mind. He's someone who can multitask. He can someone who can he's someone who can juggle a few things at one time despite interruptions. So that's an encouragement note for you. Number two, my daughter only wants to do her chores if I'm there to help her, even though I know she can do them by herself. When can I keep her company? Um, when I keep her company, she does her work, but I feel like I'm giving in. What can I do to get her to work by herself? Now, is this a learning style situation or is it beyond learning style? First, you might want to look at your reasons first for wanting her to work by herself. Is it because you're pressed for time or is it because you think she should do it by herself? Now, if it's the second reason where you think she should do it for herself, then you may want to consider if your daughter's temperament is a factor. So this could be a temperament factor. Many children get depleted when they need to be by themselves for too long often referred to extroverts. We know them as extroverts. These children actually get drained from spending time alone. So if that sounds like your child, uh, because it sounds more like my second child, um, you may want to assign tasks that involve working with other people. For example, helping to care for a younger sibling, assisting you with a certain chore. Um, so this would help. When doing schoolwork, she may prefer to do her assignments where family members are present so she can share her ideas about what she's learning. This interaction actually energizes the extroverts. Introverts, on the other hand, while still social, tend to get drained from being around people. These children will need a break to regroup before they can tackle chores or assignments, particularly those that involve interacting with others. They may work better in quiet locations in the house, freer from interruptions and the need to interact with others. Example of some isolated solitary chores are emptying the dishwasher, taking out the trash, 
or watering the plants, things that requires them to do things on their own, all right? So this is knowing whether your child is an introvert or an extrovert, okay? The third situation I gave earlier is sometimes when I'm working with my child, he seems to miss the whole point entirely, something I go through all the time. He gets caught up in learning one detail that he forgets the forgets what the main idea is. Is there something wrong? Is this a learning style um, discussion? Well, when we approach learning differently than our children, it can feel quite disconcerting. Some people like my son tend to be analytical in their approach. They break down the subject matter into small bits and then focus on the details. Doing so may provide them an appreciation for the nuances in the information and they, it allows them to delve deeply into a topic as they follow their curiosity. Um, however, at times they may lose sight of the bigger picture, which happens generally for children. They need reminders as to what the greater concept is that they're learning and need to help see if each separate pieces of information fit together to build a greater concept. The other approach is more global. These learners tend to grasp the bigger picture. Uh, they understand the important concepts and how they fit into bigger scheme. However, these children often overlook the details and learning to slow themselves down to focus on the particulars can be a struggle and feel boring. Now, what we can do is you can assist them in being mindful of the details by showing them how all of the details fall under the expense of the larger concept and are important in supporting the larger idea. In other words, to use an old cliche, um, the analytics can't see the forest from the trees while the globals don't notice the trees in the forest. Both styles have their advantages and their struggles. Now, I just got a reminder that there there's, we have six minutes left. Um, so let me see. I've got two situations left. Let me quickly go to um, the various intelligences because I, I would like to touch a bit on multiple intelligence. Now, you've heard of the various intelligences. Are they related to learning styles? Yes, they are. In the same ways that we each take in information differently, we each have certain skills that may be easier or more difficult for us to learn. Those areas that are easier would be considered our strengths. Um, the person that came up with the multiple intelligence um, is Howard Garner. Now, uh, I think the basic ones that you would know would be nine, but Howard Garner over the years has, has added uh, to the list to Please feel free to Google up to see um, what has been added and to understand further on this um, multiple intelligence area. Now, why is it important to know? Um, when your child is naturally inclined, naturally um, talented in a certain area, um, that, that becomes their strength, that becomes their expertise. Does it matter at this stage when they're preschoolers? Yes and no, because when it's a yes, it, it tells you what activities would increase their confidence, their self-confidence, um, what, what classes, you know, if you're looking for classes that could uh, be an extracurricular activity for them, this would give you an idea of what they're into. Um, no, because this is also the age where um, just because a child is into uh, is very actively involved doesn't mean he's naturally a body kinesthetic um, he has the body kinesthetic intelligence he could be a mixture as well right so that's why it's a yes and a no but as your children grow they tend to incline towards one multiple intelligence more or a combo of a few. Now, there are many websites online where you can easily get your children to, to um, do a quick questionnaire which sort of defines their multiple intelligence. Why is it important to know it? Because number one, it's their strength. Number two, if you're a parent that is involved in, in them picking their career path, this would help. Um, so let me just run through what the multiple intelligence are, the basic ones. Um, if your child is into movement, sports, dance, they are, they are more inclined to body kinesthetic. Um, if they, if you feel that your children, especially the older ones, are into understanding others, communicating, um, working in groups, um, they are inclined. They are inclined would be towards interpersonal. Intrapersonal is more of them understanding oneself, how they feel, how they think, how they personally feel, how they think. Uh, if your child is definitely into problem solving, reasoning, scientific thinking. That their inclination would be towards logical and mathematical. 
Um, if your child is more into tones, rhythms, beats, they're into musical rhythmic. Um, if your child generally has that interest in understanding words, ver they're into verbal and written proficiency and, and their memory is good, they're into verbal and linguistic. Um, if your child is more into spatial awareness, they're able to visualize what doesn't yet exist. They put their imagination to use. They are into visual and spatial. Um, that, that's just to give you an understanding of what their strengths are, what their natural ability is. Uh, something that you like to tap on, that's a different topic altogether, multiple intelligence. But today's topic is more um, towards learning styles. And, and my angle today is from a parent, talking to another parent, about how important it is to understand your child's learning style because it involves them receiving and retaining information and it would help at home in, in our home situations if we understand our child's learning style because then it makes uh, things a lot easier at home. Um, it, 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 help, it has helped me um, to be a lot calmer at home and not frustrated all the time. Um, I did not get to cover two, three questions, but um, what we will do is, um, just like the other two workshops, the other two webinars, we will compile questions together with the answers and send it to you next week so that you will not miss out on any of the questions. Uh, any of the questions. And I believe there are no other questions actually. Um, so if there are, and if we do receive, if I do hear it from our, our tech team, then we will answer those questions, questions and send the answers to you as well in an email. All right. And a recap of today's notes will be sent to you as well. So they have something as a reference. I uh, hope today's session was beneficial. Um, it, it was to... Um, help you as parents manage things better with your children at home to help you with your parenting and to just broaden your mind on knowing children's learning style all right um, if you do that it will help your relationship with your children and it will help in whatever situations you're facing even as they grow older all right okay so i think i better end here i'm already getting the cues um so i hope you had a good evening everyone um, and look forward to that email and thank you for joining us today this brings an end to our three uh, webinar topics uh, if you have any questions please feel free to call any one of us at our centers and we'll be able to answer you thank you everybody and good evening <laughs>